Exactly. Thank you, Elizabeth. Among the many classical sources for Thomas More's Utopia, Herodotus, Aristotle, Cicero, Seneca, Plutarch, Tacitus, Lucian, the most prominent, arguably, is Plato, although Cicero is quite, quite common as well. And of Plato's dialogues, the vast majority of Utopia scholarship has concerned itself with the Republic and the laws. Without denying the extent of More's use of the Republic and laws, we do well to consider two other dialogues as sources, namely the Timaeus and the Critias. These dialogues, uh, in these dialogues, the character Critias tells a tale of ancient Athens and Atlantis. Both the tale and its teller shed considerable light on More's Utopia, especially the dialectical exchange between Raphael Hephodeus and Morris in Book One. When commenting on the dialogical elements of Utopia, current scholarship has tended to focus on Plato's Republic or the dialogues of Cicero or Lucian as the principal sources for the rich dialogue on counsel, typically attending to the dialogue of Book One and the relation to book, of Book One to Book Two in rhetorical terms. And Elizabeth has done uh, wonderful work there, by the way. Uh, while these rhetorical accounts are insightful, uh, they don't tend to focus on the presence and power of dialectics in Moore's Utopia. Uh, rather than creating an imitation of a Lucianic dialogue or an exercise in deliberative rhetoric, or at least not simply that, I'm going to argue that Moore, like Plato before him, e employs dialectics and irony to assist the reader in the highest work proper to the soul, the work of perceiving the true and the good. For more, a statesman must discern, that is, he must see the true and the good in order to guide the ship of state with prudence. And there's definitely a connection with my article on seeing tyranny. I think that's a kind of a master theme for more that he picks up from the Platonic tradition, and I'm trying to work that through in different, in different uh, works of more. When encountering dialogical literature, then, the reader must exercise his faculty of judgment, carefully weighing various points of view both those found within a text and those in diverse text, in an attempt to discern the very nature of things, as Moore himself says. This act of participation through dialectic study is a natural antidote to pride, an ongoing concern for Moore in his writings, which tends to direct one toward one's own preconceived ideas of the true and the good, and thereby forestalls the exercise of prudent judgment and its pursuit of what is true and good simpliciter. Alongside dialectics, both Plato and Moore place irony. Among other things, the presence of irony in great dialogue stimulates the reader to carefully weigh the words he encounters. Are they to be taken at face value? Do they point in the opposite direction of their surface meaning? In context, what other alternatives might there be? These and related questions come to mind when a reader encounters irony in the work of a dialogical artist. Together, irony and dialectics serve to sharpen one's sense of prudent judgment, thereby opening the way for perception of the true and the good. In what follows, I will examine how the aforementioned general connection between dialectics, irony, and prudence is manifest in specific texts of Plato and Thomas More. Now, sadly, I can't get to the full scope of each one of those. I'm going to focus principally on more and leave the part on Plato uh, for you to read later, perhaps, if you're interested. Significantly, when comparing the political tales of Plato's Critias and More's Hippodeus, one finds remarkable parallels between Plato and More as literary artists teaching political truths. In Plato's Timaeus and Critias, Critias tells a tale of primeval Athens and Atlantis a tale which Critias insists is, quote, passing strange, yet wholly true. You know you're in for a tale when it starts <laughs> yes. that way, right? <clears throat> in Moore's Utopia, Hithlodeus, a man learned in nonsense, that's one version of what, what Hithlodeus means, uh, tells an extended tale of Utopia, an ideal regime which is literally no place. By examining the tales, the bearers of the tales, and the disposition, each author establishes in the reader in a careful consideration of these tales. We see two great literary artists employing the art of words in order to foster the growth of political virtue in the souls of their readers. So as promised, skipping over Plato. And right on to Thomas More. 
Perhaps the best way to begin is with a dialectical examination of the title of Utopia, namely, Concerning the Best State of a Commonwealth and the New Island of Utopia. At first glance, one might assume that an inquiry into the best state of the Commonwealth, of a Commonwealth rather, simply is a discussion of the New Island of Utopia. After all, this is apparently the perspective on the question defended by the character Hithlidaeus. But there are other possibilities. Perhaps what more, the author more means is that Utopia concerns both the best state of the Commonwealth and the New Island of Utopia. In this case, the two would not necessarily be the same thing. At least some distance between the best Commonwealth and Utopia itself is implied by character Morris's response to Hithlidaeus at the end of book two. From the opening page then, Moore puts the reader to work, inviting dialectical engagement with the text in order prudently to weigh the words of the author. We must keep these alternative readings of the title in mind as we consider the tale of Hithlidaeus within the broader context of Utopia. So my argument essentially is that even from the title itself, you see a kind of dialectical opposition that's going on. And that is going to manifest itself in several different ways. I'm going to try to, to draw those out in as much as I can with the time that I have. Before examining the tale itself, let us briefly consider its context. The tale proper occupies the better part of book two of Utopia, and what I'm referring to that as the tale is the, the account of Utopia, of course, that, that Hithlidaeus gives in book two. In book one, Peter Gilas introduces Moros to Hithlidaeus, and the three discuss a variety of social and political problems then plaguing Western Europe. Within this broad dialogical context, the interlocutors consider the particular question of whether the true philosopher should involve himself in political life by offering his wise counsel to kings. Morris advocates such involvement, citing the authority of Plato, who, quote, thinks that commonwealths will be happier only, will be happy rather, only when philosophers become kings or kings become philosophers, end quote. A clear reference to the ideal regime of Plato's Republic. For his part, Hithlidaeus adamantly rejects the notion of such involvement, a fact to which we will return below, but he nevertheless boasts of the political virtues of the utopians, of people who actually practice, as he says, the kind of thing that Plato sketches in his Republic. Hithlidaeus's references to Utopia and its citizens become more frequent toward the end of Book One, and the other interlocutors implore him to further describe the island to them. Indeed, they want to know everything about Utopia. The three decide to break for lunch and reconvene to hear the tale of Hithlidaeus in the afternoon. Book one ends as Hithlidaeus is about to begin. Thus, a brief consideration of context reveals the tale's connection to the question of a philosopher's involvement in politics, and this question, in turn, connects the tale of Hithlidaeus to the ideal commonwealth of Plato's Republic. Significantly, both the tale of Critias and the tale of Hithlidaeus have Plato's discussion of the ideal commonwealth as a background, and both seek to present that ideal commonwealth alive and in motion. Now, the terms alive and in motion are from the Timaeus, okay? And what's going on, dramatically speaking, in that work is it's said to be dramatically after the Republic. And then, so you'd have Republic, Timaeus, and Critias. And so uh, this tale that we get from from Critias at the beginning of the Timaeus, and then in a way it's duplicated and extended in, in the fragment of the Critias that we have, uh, present that tale as a, a regime that's actually alive and in motion. In other words, what we talked about in the Republic is now going to be seen in the flesh. Okay. Turning to the tale itself, we find further similarities between the tales of Critias and Hithlidaeus. For Hithlidaeus, like Critias before him, presents his tale of Utopia as that of an historical regime. In fact, Hithlidaeus goes a step further than Critias by insisting that Utopia still exists. What is more, Hithlidaeus ends his fabulous tale of Utopia with a rather audacious claim, and I quote, the institutions the Utopians have adopted have made their community most happy, and as far as anyone can tell, capable of lasting forever, end quote. Whereas Critias' tale of ancient Athens and Atlantis was but a fond memory for Critias, Hithlidaeus tells a tale of a regime that, as far as anyone can tell, may prove eternal. 
For all Hithlidaeus' protestations to the contrary, however, there are a number of reasons to distrust the tis historicity of Utopia. Initially, the trustworthiness of Hithlidaeus' tale seems to be on sure footing. Hithlidaeus is said to be uh, Portuguese by birth and to have accompanied Vespucci on the last three of his four vo voyages, accounts of which are now common everywhere. So he establishes a historic basis for, for the tales that he's going to tell. As Critias had tethered his tale to a trustworthy source, in his case, he had said that it came originally from the mouth of the revered Athenian lawgiver Solon. So too, Hithlidaeus lends credence to his account of Utopia by placing his tales of the world within the broader context of the well-documented explorations of Amerigo Vespucci. On the last of these voyages with the great explorer, Hithlidaeus per was permitted by Vespucci, after much persuasion and expostulation, to remain behind with the garrison at the farthest point of the last voyage. It is after the departure of Vespucci that Hithlidaeus and his companions make their maiden voyage to the island of Utopia. Unfortunately, once Vespucci is gone, the credibility of Hithlidaeus' adventures becomes exceedingly tenuous. Although Hithlidaeus claims that he lived in Utopia for five years and that the islands still exist, there is no tangible, empirical, empirically verifiable trace of Utopia in the entire dialogue. As R.S. Sylvester points out, we are left with the impression that, quote, Utopia has no concrete geographical existence. He sums up the situation as follows, and again, this is Sylvester. Because someone coughed too loudly, Peter Gillis tells us, Everyone missed Hithlidaeus' words giving the latitude of the new land. Hithlidaeus himself never tells us precisely how he got to Utopia, nor do we know exactly what happened to him after he delivered his discourse at Antwerp. In a letter to Gillis uh, attached as a preface to the first edition of Utopia, Moore himself remarks, in another quote, it did not occur to us to ask nor to him to say in what area of the new world utopia is to be found. I wouldn't have missed hearing about this for a sizable sum of money, for I am quite ashamed not to know even the name of the ocean where this island lies, about which I've written so much. A clearly playful irony going on here. So then, if Giles and Achilles is to be believed, uh, empirical evidence for utopia is coughed or whispered in another, uh, another text out of existence. Or if more is to be believed, neither he nor Gillis asked, nor did Hithlidaeus volunteer, where the, in the world Utopia was to be found. A rather conspicuous oversight, given the fact that Moore and Gillis implored Hithlidaeus to tell them everything about Utopia. Furthermore, as, was, as is the case uh, with the name of Atlantis in Critias' tale, both the name Utopia and other names within the tale ironically undercut any attempt to take the tale at face value. I think we're probably generally familiar with these, so I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time and move on. Um, Dominic Baker Smith, among others, sees in Moore's use of fanciful names, borrowing from Lucian, creating a serial comic context for the tale of Utopia. Those, through Moore, excuse me, though Moore may be employing Lucianic satire here, if we take seriously the relationship between Critias and Hithlidaeus, there is something deeper at work as well. As Arthur Kinney points out, we find two Englands in Utopia. And again, a quote, these extremes between a real England portrayed in a real Antwerp in Book One uh, of Utopia and an irrational nowhere in Utopia Two retain a general opposition, but the distinctions are not always sharp and absolute. For it is the fantastic Hithlidaeus who supplies much of the factually grounded criticism of Book One, while nowhere in Book Two resembles, in its pseudo history, geography, and bicameral government, Thomas More's own England rather than a strange and unknown land. Significantly, just as the tale of Critias presents the reader with two cities of Athens, and I should comment on this because I had to, to leave it out in the interest of time, there um, Atlantis ends up being, many scholars have noted, um, in a way, a tale of, a, of Athens at two different times in its history. A presentation of the Athens that was defending freedom during the Persian Wars, 
but also one that took away freedoms in the Peloponnesian War and gave rise to the Peloponnesian War. So, in a way, the defender of freedom and then the taker of freedom, the, the imperial overlord. Uh, and, and in a way, you see two Athens, and, and so too uh, here, two, two Englands. Okay. To be sure, both Anglins are not within the tale of Hithlodeus. Nevertheless, both Plato and Moore present two pictures of regime, each of which is and is not that regime in a variety of senses. This complex dialectical presentation of political regimes encourages the reader prudently to weigh the regimes against one another and thereby come to a clearer knowledge of how political principles apply in the real world. This brings us to one of the most crucial, yet uh, at times misunderstood, aspects of the dialectics of utopia. While scholars readily note the ambiguity of the names of the principal interlocutors, the irony of the Lucianic appellations of utopian persons and places, and other humorous incongruities in the book, they sometimes fail to allow these ironies and ambiguities to do their proper dialogical work, dialectical work, I should say. If, like the tale of Critias, the tale of Hithlodeus is passing strange yet wholly true, then we will need to, be di we will need to dialectically weigh each of Raphael Hithlodeus's words, not simply accept or reject them in toto. It is generally acknowledged that the observations he makes in Book I of the social and political problems then plaguing England are indeed astute. But simply because he can diagnose the social and political problems of his day, it certainly does not follow that Hithlodeus can clearly see the politically prudent solution to these problems. Now, I want to underscore this, of course, because Moore himself does. He speaks about sight throughout Utopia, and he's drawing on, I think, Platonic uh, predecessors in this regard, both Plato himself and others in the Neoplatonic tradition. Uh, but the question of how to see things politically is more than just simply seeing what's before you, seeing the injustice, seeing the the elements of society that are in need of reform. Um, you need a further sight, a foresight, to be able to see into how the statesman should organize things and be involved in political life in order uh, to bring about some kind of a solution. Okay, this is not to say, of course, that his solutions are simply to be dismissed, that is, those of Hithlodeus. Rather, it should give us reason for pause before accepting or rejecting them uncritically. It also underscores the difficult task of the statesman who must carefully weigh political possibilities in order to discern the best way forward. For the statesman, there is a constant tension between the way things are and what we desire to see. Moore goes to great lengths to dramatize this tension. In the aforementioned letter to Gilas, Moore casts himself as a critias, implicitly raising the question of how to distinguish imagined regimes from actual ones. Moore writes, but I see, my dear Gillis, some men are so suspicious that in their circumspect sagacity they can hardly be brought to believe that we simple-minded and credulous fellows wrote down uh, all that we did of Hithlodeus' story. My personal credibility among these people may be shaken, not to speak of my reputation as a historian. Right? Clearly playful, um, but I think it points in the direction of, of the way that I'm reading here. Moore further protests that others besides he and Gillis were there to hear Hithlodeus, and if not, even that satisfies the skeptic. Moore directs us to ask Hithlodeus himself. Though Moore was not, has not seen him since that day, he has been told by travelers out of Portugal that he is still healthy and vigorous as ever. Thus, Moore not only juxtaposes imagined regimes with real ones, but also imagined persons with actual ones. And I think this gets to a point uh, that, that helps us as well, namely looking at those characters. Is there a real Hithlodeus? Well, I could say, of course not. Is there even a real Moros who worries about his reputation as a historian? Arguably, no. Uh, there's a way in which Morris is and is not Thomas More, right? And to create that distance between them, I think, is crucial to more of an even-handed assessment of what's going on, especially in, in Book Two. Um, by fictionalizing himself speaking with a fictive Hithlodeus, Morris' utopia 
Moore's utopia, rather, is itself a third removed from reality, signifying again a connection with Plato. The third removed refers to Book 10 of The Republic, where he's speaking it three times removed, and so that adds a further kind of necessi- excuse me, necessity for a dialectical winnowing of what, what we find there. Okay, so I'm going to skip on toward the end here in, in the interest of time. Um, Okay, yes. So I've already said a bit about the seeing and not seeing. I've got a lot on that, um, but I'm going to skip over it as well. Endeavoring to see clearly is the business of dialectics. It is also the business of statesmanship. When we get to Morris's lines at the end of Utopia, we realize that the work of dialectics is meant to continue beyond the pages of the text itself if the true goal of political clear-sightedness is to be achieved. Throughout Hithlodeus's tale of Utopia, we find many de- details that, as Morris points out, are really absurd. In addition to his chief objections against communal living and a moneyless economy, Morris also mentions the Utopians' methods of waging war and their religious practices. At every turn, however, Hithlodeus assures his interlocutors that the Utopians are well pleased with the arrangement. Of course, they must be since they too are the creation of his politically idealistic mind. Hithlodeus has absolute coercive power over each and every person in Utopia. And why shouldn't he? The answer to this question is found back in Morris's ex- ex- exhortation to Hithlodeus, where he urges him not to, quote, force strange and untested ideas on people. And arguably, that's at least in part one of the things we need to take seriously when we're reading the words of Hithlodeus. This is exactly what Hithlodeus' utopian brainchild does. No one can object to the strange and untested ideas of Hithlodeus' uh, ideal regime, since neither the interlocutors nor the readers have any way of seeing this regime alive and in motion. Any opposition to his utopian dream has been edited, at, edited out by Hithlodeus and through through more, that is. (laughs) At the same time, there seems to be much that is wholly true in Hithlodeus' assessment of the social and political ills of his day. And while we may not be inclined to accept the Hithlodean vision carte blanche, there is certainly a measure of truth in it as well. Recall that it is the fool, Morris, who advocates political involvement. I think we're meant to ask ourselves, is statesmanship folly? Because Moore, the fool, is the one who gets himself actively involved in statesmanship. If not, where exactly is the truth in the utopia? The text before us artfully presents a dialectical exchange left incomplete. What would Morris the statesman say in response to Hithlodeus? I think that's one of the first questions we should ask at the end of the the utopia. But I don't think we should end there, because that would assume that Morris, in a way, is simply Moore, right? What should we say? Perhaps the only reliable path toward answers to these questions is a rereading of Moore's Utopia, one accomplished in the presence of like-minded friends committed to dialectically pursuing a clear vision of political things. How am I doing on time? Do I have time for well, one more? A, well, a, little more a little bit more time. Okay, I, I can just round it out here Maybe fairly quickly. Three okay, I can do, easily do it in that. Okay. While many readers of Utopia have correctly noted uh, profound connections between it and Plato's Republican laws, there has been little discussion of the connections between Utopia and Critias's tale of ancient Athens and Atlantis in Plato's Timaeus and Critias. Uh, what I've shared today has been a small effort to further this discussion. In Critias's tale of Athens and Atlantis, and in Hithlodeus's tale of Utopia, we have seen two great writers of dialogues employing the art of words in order to foster the growth of political virtue, and prudence in particular, in the souls of their readers. As great authors, though, neither is satisfied with instruction alone. Reflecting upon when he first read the tale of ancient Athens and Atlantis, Critias remarks that he had, quote, uh, the greatest pleasure and amusement in hearing it. Such is the common experience of those who read this tale in, in the Timaeus and Critias. Likewise, in his subtitle to Utopia, Moore refers to it as, quote, a truly golden handbook, no less beneficial than entertaining. 
These passing strange yet wholly true tales delight and instruct at the same time. In the process, they invite active dialectical engagement on the part of their readers. Perhaps it was just such a dialectical exercise that prepared more for the decisions he would later make as a statesman. In writing Utopia, he invites any readers who choose to join him in thinking through the fundamental issues to gain a clearer view of political things. Thank you.